Hello, welcome back. We're into chapter seven now. This is the second uh, half of unit three. Chapter seven is all about bacterial metabolism. And I want to warn you that in some ways, I think this can be one of the hardest sections of this course. Um, it combines a little chemistry, um, a little a bit of maybe what you might think is a boring subject. I know when I was a student, I certainly thought metabolism was kind of boring. But um, I would say that this is extremely useful because evolutionarily, we and bacteria are very closely related in terms of how we do metabolism because our mitochondria originally were bacteria. So if you learn bacterial metabolism, you will have a good or better understanding of human metabolism. And we're only going to touch the surface of this. If you find you're struggling with these lectures, I might recommend that you do read this chapter in the textbook as well. This is the one time where I would say uh, possibly reading the textbook may give you a different and fresh perspective on it. It may help reinforce this information. I'm going to try to keep it as basic as possible, but um, we do have to talk about some things that are unfamiliar to us. For us, uh, bacterial metabolism is how bacteria make their energy by breaking down uh, molecules, but also how they build new products. Um, and this is really critical uh, in understanding microbes, but also identifying microbes. We've talked several times about using fermentation to differentiate between microbes. So that is a critical use of bacterial metabolism. So whenever a new microbe is discovered, we uh, like to discover its uh, metabolism, because then we can find ways to identify it. There are two major terms that I want to lay out here before we start anything uh, that this chapter will deal with. There's kind of a cycle that's going on here. We have a series of energy releasing reactions. We call this catabolism. That's the breakdown of molecules and the release of energy. And this catabolism is coupled with reactions that capture that energy and use it to build new molecules. That is called anabolism. Um, you can think of anabolic steroids. Those are steroids that help build muscles, right? Um, that, that's kind of a similar use of anabolism there. So anabolism is building up molecules, and to do that, you have to spend energy. And to get that energy, you do catabolism, which breaks down molecules and releases energy. So this is kind of a cycle that's going on here. In this chapter, we'll talk about several different types of biochemical reactions that provide energy for life. Uh, we will talk about how metabolism interacts with human health in terms of um, how we identify things and um, particularly how pathogens kind of uh, live inside of us in many cases. We'll talk a little bit about photosynthesis and um, just briefly about nitrogen fixation um, and how that's helped support life. And ultimately, right, microbes doing these processes uh, allow us to live because we are heterotrophs. We have to live off of those organisms. So let's start with a case study here. We have Shane, he's a 21 year old college student on spring break in Cancun, and he's getting lots of drinks from the stand that is on the beach. So he's chilling on the beach, uh, getting drinks just from there. When he gets back to school, uh, he starts feeling really sick. And this isn't just a hangover, this is severe abdominal cramps, watery diarrhea, oh, we've seen diarrhea in a lot of these, and he has a fever of 102 Fahrenheit, so 38.9 C. So clearly something is wrong here. It's probably an infection of some sort. Day two, he starts to see blood in his stool. This is known as dysentery. So dysentery is bloody stool. Um, he goes to the health clinic, but they send him to the hospital because this is a little bit beyond them. And at the hospital, he has obvious dehydration um, from the diarrhea and the stool samples are very bloody, and his rectal exam is painful with bleeding. So uh, this is not a good scenario. Some sort of gastrointestinal issue has occurred here. 
So, unfortunately, if you're the lab tech or the person collecting the sample, you have to get one of these poo samples, and it goes to the lab. And in this case, it's going to be cultured on hectoin agar, which we talked a little bit about in the lab. It's a type of differential and selective medium. So we're going to uh, inhibit the growth of gram positives because in most cases, gastrointestinal illnesses are not caused by gram positives. So we're going to rule those out and we're going to select for gram negatives. So anything that grows is gram negatives. On hectoin agar, it's pretty clever because some enteric pathogens like salmonella are going to produce hydrogen sulfide uh, because of their metabolism, and that's going to turn the colonies black. Other things like shigella or E. coli produce colonies that are not black. Um, remember, E. coli um, might be lactose fermenting, so we can uh, differentiate that here. And shigella will just be its normal color. These are all indicators, right, that are using differences in metabolism here to differentiate. So his culture produced colonies without a color. So that indicated to the um, microbiologist that this is an enteric pathogen, Shigella. So Shigella makes a toxin that can cause this. And... Uh, there are different strains of Shigella, so they're going to further refine this and they're going to do what's called serotyping, which means they apply different antibodies and see which strain of Shigella it is. In this case, it's, it's Shigella flexneri, and um, it's a common cause of traveler's diarrhea, and it comes from contaminated water. So Shane was drinking his drinks, which probably were watered down or something like that on the beach, and... Uh, he got traveler's diarrhea because of this Shigella flexneri. Um, so to treat him, right, uh, they're going to do the IV rehydration. Um, so you'll give him an IV with liquids and lots of salts and sugars in there. Quinolone is the antibiotic of choice for Shigella. Um, and this isn't just picked out of the air. They actually take the Shigella strain that he has and they grow it and they test different antibiotics to see whether this specific strain is susceptible to one or killed best by one. And then they'll prescribe that one. So he makes a full recovery. So this antibiotic testing will actually do this in the lab uh, ourselves. After this, right, he does his course of antibiotics. He makes a full recovery. Shigella is really interesting. It has a very low infectious dose. Um, you can have just as little as 10 bacteria that can cause this condition. So very common when people travel, uh, if they use contaminated water, even like if you brush your teeth with contaminated water, you could theoretically get enough microbes to cause this happening. So this was all because of biochemical differences in their metabolism. And we used the hectoin agar to identify different groups, all right? So our lactose fermenters, E. coli, Klebsiella, things like that, uh, they would turn pink on this agar, so we could rule them out. Salmonella, on the other hand, makes that hydrogen sulfide. It turns the colonies black. We did not see that. Um, in the final case, uh, it's real hard to see here, but uh, there are some kind of greenish colonies on here that um, are uh, the Shigella, and um, those were the ultimate cause of this. So this agar is really, really quite useful. It's a very rapid, cheap, and easy test to do. So that's a use of metabolism, right? We're gonna back up and look at uh, the some of the reactions that go into metabolism. We won't get into all the specific ones there, but uh, we first need to talk about energy. There are reactions in metabolism that break down molecules, and provide energy. In some cases, some of that energy comes from the sun. Ultimately, all of our energy is coming from the sun and going through photosynthesis. But a lot of organisms are doing organotrophy, where they're breaking down organic molecules that were made by photosynthetic microbes or plants. Um, some microbes can do lithotrophy. We're not really going to talk too much about these reactions. We're going to talk about the importance of energy for living cells. And there's this measure called entropy that I'm lightly going to touch on. Um, and then we're going to talk a lot about enzymes. So we've talked about enzymes. They're proteins, right? They're catalysts that speed up reactions or control reactions. 
All of metabolism is controlled by a series of enzymes that regulate the reactions that occur. And these are very critical for this process to happen properly. So in order to build this highly organized cell over here, the organism needs to take energy and use that energy to put together small molecules into larger ones. So it takes small molecules over here that are just kind of randomly floating around and it puts them together and organizes them into a living thing. So organisms take small molecules and then use energy to build larger ones. That's how, uh, that's, that's called biosynthesis, right? That's building a uh, biomass. And ultimately we have the sun out there, right? That's sending energy to earth. And the photoautotrophs are taking that light energy and fixing CO2 into chains of carbon. That builds what we call biomass. In the process, there is heat loss uh, out of that. But we build biomolecules that have some stored energy in them. You can then have heterotrophs that take that biomass, break it down, use that energy to uh, build up their bodies then they die. Then there's decomposers that break down that biomass and uh, they die. And then uh, the, the process kind of repeats. But in every step, there is heat lost. So ultimately, there's always a loss in these, right? You're always losing a little bit of energy. So um, some of the most efficient is the photosynthesis. But along the way, there's energy being lost. So we constantly have this energy coming back from the sun. If we didn't have the sun, there would not be enough energy feeding into this process to keep it going. This heat loss is called entropy. You may have heard of it before. Um, it is always there, right? No reaction is 100% efficient at transferring energy. So I just want you to know there's a little bit of loss at every step. So all of this energy is ultimately coming from the sun over here. And that reaction is phototrophy. So light gets absorbed and that, uh, raises the energy state of some molecules that donate high energy electrons. They take water and carbon dioxide and fix the carbon together, build it into a chain that is a sugar. So six of these CO2 molecules and a bit of hydrogen from the water, and we get a simple sugar like glucose. In the process, they make a waste product called oxygen. And that oxygen is really useful for us because we are chemotrophs. We have to get our energy from food molecules, uh, where that's where we get our high energy electrons. So in metabolism, you can think of high energy electrons. They're like energy that can be used to do other reactions. Aerobic organotrophs use oxygen to power this reaction. So you take sugar and oxygen and break the sugar down. You end up with energy being released as well as some water and CO2 being made. You can have anaerobic organotrophy. Uh, this includes fermentation, so changing sugar into like ethanol and CO2. Very little energy is made in this process. Or there are reactions called anaerobic respiration, which is similar to this, but oxygen is not involved in the process. So it doesn't make quite as much energy in this case. The lithotrophs uh, do similar things, but using non-organic uh, electron sources. An interesting side note here, lithotrophy often um, comes to the forefront when farmers overuse nitrogen containing fertilizers, um, things high, high spreading of manure or synthetic nitrogen fertilizers can lead to lithotrophs um, kind of coming to the front. Um, and it leads to high levels of what are called nitrates that are uh, byproducts of this reaction. And that can actually run off into the water sources and cause algal blooms downstream and things like that. So there are some negatives uh, to over applying fertilizers, even organic fertilizers like manure. Ultimately, these are all energy re releasing reactions. So it's not written explicitly in here, but energy is released in all of these reactions. That's the goal of metabolism. That energy, right, from this catabolism, so those were all catabolic reactions, that energy is then coupled to new reactions that build up new molecules. 
So you eat your sugary food and you break it down and that energy is released and then you use that energy to build up new biomass in your body. Controlling all of this are the enzymes. So the energy in these systems, right, is cycling around and enzymes are controlling the different steps here, the different parts of catabolism, of breaking down, the different bits of anabolism, of building up. So we can have sugar, right, releases energy, and then the cell synthesizes new proteins from that. Enzymes are managing that energy transfer. They're keeping it controlled. They're keeping it from going too slow and life not happening anymore, death, right? And they're keeping it from going too fast as well. So remember that enzymes lower that activation uh, energy of any chemical reaction that they're uh, monitoring so that it will happen, but they also control the rate that it happens at. So why do you need to control the rate of a reaction? Okay, here's an analogy. This is a marshmallow on a stick, right? I think we're all pretty familiar with this. You, you might not believe it, but you are like a marshmallow in that you are full of high energy nutrients. I know we don't think of marshmallows as nutritious, but they're actually full of glucose, sugars, things like that. So they have lots of energy stored in the chemical bonds in those molecules. Now, what happens if you stick that marshmallow in the fire, right? Think about that. Well, first it's going to start to turn uh, a little bit uh, kind of mushy. Then it's going to get a little bit golden, that perfect golden brown that I love. And if you're a monster and you let your marshmallow light on fire, it bursts into flames and starts burning. That is an uncontrolled chemical reaction. So you are like a marshmallow. Right, You have all this energy in you, and if the reactions in your body went too fast, you would pretty much light on fire, right? You would uh, burst into flames because there's so much energy stored in you. Enzymes are what control these reactions. So without them, we would have improper distribution of the energy. This allows small bits of energy to be released in measured bites, and then we can use that energy to build new molecules, do other things. Okay, so that's the first part of metabolism here. We have energy, and almost all that energy uh, on Earth is coming from the sun. The phototrophs are taking that, and then the heterotrophs are eating the phototrophs and things like that. There are different types of metabolism that yield different amounts of energy. Uh, Right, we talked about phototroph, organotrophy, aerobic and anaerobic. There's also fermentation in there. Uh, and then to the side is lithotrophy. This is all regulated by enzymes. We're not going to talk too much about the individual enzymes. If you took a 400 level biochemistry course, you'd have to memorize these pathways and all the enzymes that control them. Don't worry, we're not doing that. I have nightmares of that, so I, I will not subject you to that. But just know that at each step in these processes, there's an enzyme there that is a protein that you make that controls these reactions and make sure it happens at the proper time and place. All right, that's it for 7.1.